Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. So tonight we're going to talk about what's bugging my garden. And so uh, I kind of had an alternate name for this. It's scouting uh, for insects in the garden or something along that line. Because to me, lots of times what I find out is when people bring to me a question or a problem, it's too late. It's already beyond just starting. It's full blown. So what I want to try to do is kind of walk through folks through sort of what I kind of do when I'm in the garden, when I'm looking at things. If you've ever attended uh, a garden walk I've done, I've done a couple of those uh, in Johnson City as well as here in Jonesboro, kind of the sort of the same thing we do, just we're sitting here in front of the screen tonight uh, to do it. Um, but basically just some things about and primarily insect pests. We can sort of broadly apply this to diseases as well. And certainly if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those. But I thought we'd try to look a little bit more on insects. And a lot of the principles are going to apply to uh, diseases in our garden as well. So let me just say, if I use brand name sources, anything like that, just understand it's not endorsement by myself nor the university, nor are we meaning anything negative if I leave off a similar company or product. Likewise, uh, let me just uh, reiterate what you hear me say it all the time. Pesticide labels are the law. Nothing I say or nothing you find on the internet trumps that. So you have to do what that label tells you and only what the label tells you. So if we're talking about pest control in any form or fashion, we have to touch a little bit on integrated pest management. And, and to me, if we're trying to sum up integrated pest management in, in as few words as possible, it's using all potential control methods, not just chemical controls. It doesn't mean we don't use chemical controls, but we look at other options and we look at things in concert with one another. One of the big things with IPM is figuring out what do we have there as a pest. And so inspection or scouting is extremely important to find the pest early. And that is important because early is going to help us when it comes time to actually controlling things. Another key point of integrated pest management is we want healthy plants. So we're assuming we're already doing all the proper practices when it comes to planting and growing and fertilizing. And certainly now the weather we're having watering uh, so that our plants are staying healthy because healthy plants naturally resist pests anyway. And so we want everything in our favor as possible. So when we talk about non-chemical tactics, and, and these can fall under a number of different umbrellas, whether uh, physical controls, cultural controls, biological controls, etc. But they're just things that we do in the garden that basically help us deal with pests. So sometimes it can be changing when we plant. So we may try to avoid uh, large pest populations by planting early or late. Uh, it's things like cleaning up the garden at the end of the season or as plants start to go by the wayside. We pull them out so they don't become nurseries for diseases or insects. Physical exclusion, floating row covers, uh, those uh, lightweight materials that we can use to seal off plants, we can seal out pests. You have to be careful you don't seal pests in. Uh, when I was in college, we were doing some trials in this one entomology class, and they had created cages, and we and they were using the remake cloth, but they were a wooden frame. And we put those over, it was brassicas, I can't remember if it was broccoli, kale, or whatever. Well, ended up, we still had caterpillars eating on those because what everybody figured out was when they had the plants hardening off outside, the eggs were laid by the butterflies and moths for the caterpillars. So don't cover up the caterpillars as eggs inside your floating row cover. It doesn't work out too well. And of course, there's limitation with floating row covers when it comes to pollination. We have plants that need pollination. We know where those are coming off, but a good tactic. Resistant varieties. I think this is more principally for diseases rather than insects. But uh, certainly there could be some variability. We know there are certain crops like um, blue hubbard squash that are known for being very attractive uh, to things like cucumber beetles and squash bugs for whatever the exact reason. But oftentimes uh, we can maybe switch to a different variety and at least make it a little less attractive. Um, and the other thing to consider is plantings for beneficial insects or refuges. I always like to caution in these sorts of talks that having you know, flowers and things like that are great in the garden. It provides nectar and pollen resources for adult insects, some of which are pollinators, some of which are beneficials that eat other insects. 
But if we're talking about cabbage uh, looper uh, butterflies, they're also feeding on nectar. And so it's not an all or nothing sort of thing. So we can have those beneficial plantings. Just understand it's more of a balancing act because we're wanting to encourage beneficials, but at the same time, those same resources in theory can be used by some of our pests too. So sometimes I think it's so oversold, especially on the internet where, hey, if we plant some marigolds by our plants, now we don't have to deal with insects. It's not that simple, unfortunately, but if you wanna plant marigolds, please feel free to do so. It's not a bad thing. Uh, it's just, it's limited what it might exactly do for us. Um, the big question I always have for especially home gardeners is, do I need to spray? And so a lot of this comes down to what's your personal threshold? So certainly if we're selling for market, most of the time we want uh, to take products because of what people will buy that are um, excellent in appearance. Um, aesthetics is really high on what we have to achieve. In the home garden, we don't really have that. So if you're not afraid to cut around the bad spot in a tomato or uh, any other thing we may be harvesting out of the garden, then you're probably going to be okay to be a little more lax in some of your pest control. Uh, now, certainly there are some uh, pests that we're more concerned with because the level of damage they can achieve. Uh, but basically, if you can tolerate your food to be a little bit ugly, you can do a little less. So personally in my home garden, I really don't use any sort of pest control products, not because I'm against them, but by the time I buy them and mix them and spray them, I've got enough labor into it. I'm just going to buy it from somebody. So I do plant some things. I water them, I fertilize them, but that's about the limit of my care. And they look like that's the limit of my care too. So, you know, it's one of those scenarios where uh, I do pick disease resistant varieties specifically because of my care or lack thereof. Um, but, you know, it is that scenario. If I have a bad outcome, if something is hammered by a pest, I'll just go buy it. And so for a lot of home gardeners, that's just the reality. So just keep in mind our gardens that grow our vegetables well are also our gardens that are creating a place for those insects or even diseases to thrive. So it's a balancing act that we're always working with. Insecticides, I don't go into a lot of detail about insecticides in this talk. Um, there may be a few brief mentions as we go along. I will say that, you know, we do want to protect our beneficials whenever possible when we're using these. So, you know, um, applying um, our insecticides late in the evening at dusk, when pollinators aren't physically present in the garden for some things like cucurbit crops or cucumbers and squashes who flowers only last one day, that means we're really minimizing the potential contact with an insecticide for those pollinators coming to the flowers. So just little things like that we can do that can make a big difference on protecting those beneficials. We can look at different chemistry of products and figure out, could there be one uh, product that is less likely to have uh, off species uh, effect? And, and maybe that's the one we use. Uh, and so there are some resources that I'll point you to at the end that you can look at for that. And certainly you're more than welcome to ask me questions. Um, the big thing about utilizing pesticides correctly is make sure you're using the correct rate or the correct amount. So you're gonna to have to read the label. You're gonna to have to have, in some cases you have differing amounts of product you'll be using depending on the specific pest, especially if it's a broadly labeled product for both ornamentals as well as edibles, you may find different rates and you have to make sure you're using the right one because too little, it may not take care of the pest. Too much, one, you're wasting money, and two, we don't want to be exposing ourselves or the environment in general to anything more than what's needed. Uh, so certainly make sure we're using those products at the correct rate and make sure we're using them for the right site. You don't want to take a product that is only labeled for use on your lawn and use it in your garden. There may be very real reasons why it's not labeled for use in your garden. So don't, uh, again, don't ignore the label, follow that label. The other thing to think about for most homeowner products, we don't typically think about uh, protective equipment. Uh, 
or PPE uh, whenever we're utilizing these. But I encourage folks, if you're mixing any sort of pesticide product, even organic products, uh, have some safety goggles on, use gloves, because that's when these products are in their most concentrated form and when they're at the highest risk to us. So even if it's a low acute toxicity product, we still want to minimize our contact. A uh, story from when I was in college, uh, the organic farm at the University of Kentucky, they were utilizing a weed control product that was I think clove oil or something else. It was a plant-based oil. That was an herbicide. Uh, one of the guys spraying it, even though he was wearing proper protective equipment, he managed to get it in his eye and he had to go to the emergency room. So, you know, that's an organic product, a plant-derived product, but there's still cautions associated with it. So don't take too lightly uh, that pesticides can't, uh, you know, be a danger to us. I don't think we have to live in fear of them, but a little bit of caution, I think, is warranted. One thing we probably don't do a great job with in the home garden, it's because the information isn't readily available, is rotating the mode of action of pesticides. So different pesticides, for instance, different insecticides kill insects in different ways. Some of them interrupt the molting, some of them interrupt uh, the nervous system of an insect. So they do different things. In an ideal program, we are changing that up. We're not just using a single insecticide all season long. We're using different insecticides purposely so we don't select for a population that's resistant for that control method. The reason it's hard for homeowners is unless you have a background in chemistry, you probably don't know how these act. Uh, even I don't know every single one of them in detail. I can tell you some of the broad categories, but not necessarily every individual active ingredient. On the commercial side, we actually have labeling on the product that tells us this. They are assigned codes, and it's easy. Just look for a different code if you're wanting to switch up mode of action. Home folks don't have that, so it is something to consider to not always use the same product all the time. But just understand, you know, if every insecticide you're using ends in T-H-R-I-N, they're all relatively the same chemical in the way they act. They have the same mode of action. So different products, even different active ingredients are still sometimes acting in the same manner. Sometimes for our home gardeners, we run into a scenario where we're buying the bulk containers and we're mixing our own, nothing wrong with that. But then we end up with a pesticide that we don't need the amount we mix. So what do we do with it? How do we dispose it? The easiest way to dispose is actually applying it to a labeled area. So if it's something that could be applied to your lawn or to your landscape, that's the easiest way to get rid of it. One way we can sidestep that is looking at buying ready to use products. And so, yes, they are more expensive per unit, uh, you know, fluid ounce, for instance, but we don't really have the same problem of a lot of material left over. And so for a lot of home gardens, the quantity we need is pretty small. So sometimes those smaller containers of ready use products are the best way to go. I want to point you towards one resource. And again, there'll be some links at the end that will help you get to these resources. Uh, not the most, I, I kind of like the, the, the name of this one. It's You Can Control Garden Insects. Uh, I would say probably 90% of your insect problems will be covered by this publication, if not more than that. So for instance, it will have the crop listed. It will have um, some uh, insecticides that can be used to address those pests and then some other details. It does have some amounts of product to mix with, for instance, a gallon. Uh, to create a spray, always double check formulations change. And certainly uh, the university tries their best to keep this current, but it is on you to make sure that you do have the correct rate of use. It also mentioned things such as the minimal uh, pre-harvest interval, or as they describe it on here, uh, the minimum interval between last application and harvest. Uh, depending on the product, uh, it could be zero or it could be a couple of weeks. And all that is, is to limit our exposure to that pesticide. So, uh, you know, a lot of people say, I wanna avoid the use of chemicals or I wanna avoid my exposure to pesticides. And this is one very practical way of doing it. The label says we have to wait between the last application of the product and then the harvest. And the reason it's there is to maximize or minimize the potential that we're gonna be exposed to that chemical. 
So good information all in one spot. And again, very large percentage of the possible insects we might see in the home garden will be covered in that publication. Another one that I think they did a terrible job with the main, but of course they never asked me about that. Uh, the name of it is Conventional and Organic Product Overview for Home Vegetable Gardeners in Tennessee. The thing that bugs me is they never say pesticide, because what this is, this is a document that looks at all the active ingredients of a number of different pesticides, insecticides, as well as um, disease control products, mite control products, etc. And it's great information. It tells you some brand names that are out there that you actually see in stores, not just the active ingredient. It will talk about pests that it's good for, and then there'll be other details. Really great publication. I just think that name doesn't tell me how great it is. And so this is one, if you want to know, well, you know, should I be using this product or that product or what might be an organic option in this scenario? Because it will have organic options as well. This could be the publication that helps you make that decision. Of course, you're more than welcome also to always reach out to me. So I'd said earlier that with integrated pest management, scouting is important. That's just kind of what we are here this evening to talk about. And so the reason we want to scout is we want to limit the potential damage to that crop. The earlier we find a problem, the easier it is to fix and the less damage. And so when it comes to insects, small insects, whether they're small caterpillars or the early instars of um, various insects, they're easier to kill when they're smaller, plain and simple. There are some organic products that work very well against young insects. When you get mature insects, they really start to struggle. And so especially on the organic side, I think it's critical, but even with conventional products, the same thing holds true. We have better control when things are younger. Let me encourage you, if you use reading glasses, take those with you out to the garden. Having a magnifying glass, even if you don't use reading glasses, is a good idea because we want to be finding things newly hatched when they're really small. So some of these are, you know, if this were a printed page in front of you, they might be as small as the size of that bullet on a printed page, which is pretty doggone small, very small. And so because of that, we need to be able to see those. So having a uh, magnifying glass or a loop or other magnifying lens is a good thing to have in your toolbox in the garden because it can let you decide, hey, wait a second, am I looking at a pest? Am I looking at a beneficial? or is this just some dirt that splashed up there? And if you don't have the ability to do that, it kind of limits uh, some of your decision-making. What happens a lot of the time, I think, is we just look for a negative plant symptom. So we see a plant's not doing well and then we investigate. It's not bad, but the problem is we've already got a problem there. And so that's, to me, it's a reactionary thing. We, we have a problem, we're saying, why is this problem happening? What I'd love you to do is to be looking for problems before they start, be looking for those insects, even diseases, before you're seeing a dramatic effect to that plant. Because if you're just reacting to the negative, damage has already occurred to some extent. And in some instances, uh, it may be too far gone for that plant. And honestly, that happens a lot with me. Sometimes I get calls, people reach out after we've reached a level where there's not a lot we could do. Uh, and in truth, uh, curative products on the disease side pretty much don't exist. If we have a disease well established in a plant, uh, that we don't have curative products. Most of our fungicides, bactericides, et cetera, they are all protected. It's their armor. They get in place before the disease is there and they protect it. So that means if we're just seeing the start of a disease, we can come in and we can protect that uh, later growing foliage that's coming out or fruit. Um, but the one that's already effective, we really can't do a lot about. So just be aware of that, that this common way, it gives us some ability to do some control, but not great. What we do if we're doing preventatively is we're looking for maybe the very beginning of symptoms. And sometimes that's not really a stressor on that plant. It's something else that we're seeing. So what I thought we would do is we'd go through a few examples here in a moment on some things that you should be kind of looking for when you're out in the garden. So we'll talk about sort of what are we looking for? Where do we find them? So insects, where do we find insects on a plant normally? 
more often than not, they hide. So they're on the underside of plant leaves. Uh, if you have uh, tight buds or whorls of leaves on a plant, you'll find them hiding in there. Why do these insects hide? Because everybody eats them. Reptiles, amphibians, birds, other insects, the ones that aren't hiding typically are really bright colored. And typically they're warning everybody that would eat them, hey, I taste bad. Sometimes it's from um, plant chemicals that they accumulate from the plants they eat on. Sometimes it's just naturally occurring, but generally bright things say, are saying danger. They're a little more noticeable for that very reason. But a lot of things, if we just casually glance at a bed of plants, you're not going to see much. You have to start looking closely, flipping leaves over, pulling things back, that sort of thing. Another thing that happens, uh, I think Colorado potato beetle is a perfect example of this. Those suckers will drop off the plant when you walk up close to the plant. Mm -hmm. So you will see damage, feeding damage on the plant. You won't see any adults on it. Where'd they go? You can literally watch them drop off the plant and they'll go down to the ground where, especially if you use mulch, like I encourage you to, they'll have a great place to hide. So, you know, insects are not dumb. They know everybody's trying to eat them. So they're trying not to be seen. Makes our job harder. Not even to mention, you know, the color of the insect. Some of them will do mimicry. So, you know, there are caterpillars that look like bird droppings. You would swear they were bird droppings. They're not. There are other leaf hoppers that look like a thorn on a stem. So, you know, they do things to camouflage or mimic something that is supposed to be there and make it even harder for us. So it's not always easy to find these and that's why we have to be so intentional with it. We want to look not just for the adult insect, but all stages. Keep in mind, there's two broad categories of development with insects, complete and incomplete metamorphosis. Basically with complete metamorphosis, you have the egg that becomes the larva when it hatches. It grows for a while, it becomes a pupa, and then in the pupa, it turns into the adult. So butterflies, beetles are a perfect example of complete metamorphosis. With incomplete metamorphosis, it's a little bit simpler. We don't have that larval stage. We have nymphal stages or instars. I used that word earlier. Uh, and all a nymph is is basically an immature insect. And so you have, uh, if you've ever seen little bitty tiny grasshoppers and you think, oh, it's a baby grasshopper, you were probably right. That is a small, young grasshopper. Uh, it'll be missing some um, features that the adult has, like it won't have wings generally. Uh, oftentimes they don't have their reproductive parts, but as they mature, as they get larger, as they're shedding their exoskeletons, uh, eventually they'll reach the adult stage. And so that's kind of the two things that are happening out there. Incomplete often looks similar. I won't say identical, but you can see how the nymph would become that adult. With the complete metamorphosis, who in the world would expect a caterpillar to be a butterfly or a moth, really? You don't. So sometimes you have a very different looking immature stage than you do the adult. One thing I do when I'm in the garden, I try to look for things that look out of place on that plant. And that's going to vary on plants because we know some things have hairy stems, some things don't, some leaves are shiny, some leaves aren't. But I look for colors, textures, size discrepancies, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and shapes that just aren't expected on that plant. So some of this you kind of have to know your plants a little bit from taking care of them. So basically the more time I think you spend in the garden, the easier this becomes. Uh, and then lastly, identification is important because what if it isn't beneficial? We don't want to be killing our beneficial insects, uh, whether they're pollinators or predatory insects that are eating the bad guys. And then we've got a lot of insects out there that they're really not a pest to us, truly. They just happen to be on the plant. They even may be feeding on the plant, but they're not really that injurious to it. And as hard a time as insects have uh, anymore, you know, to me, I try not to kill anything that's not an absolute problem for me. So personally, I think, you know, if we can let something just go on, if it's just an incidental pest, we'll probably be better off in the end. So that's what I thought. Hey. All right. So you're in your garden. Here we have some garden beans. 
and you see the leaf and something's eating on the leaf. And if you look closely at that leaf, and I took this picture just last week, if you look closely at the leaf, you actually see netting. You actually see where the veins are left behind on the leaf. Because of experience, I've got a couple of candidates in the top of my mind that this could be. So what do I do? I know the insect is not gonna be sitting up on top of the plant, so I start flipping leaves. I first see it peeking out from underneath the leaf there, and then I flip it over and get a better look. So we've got a copperish color beetle. It's on beans. We have netted damage. That's basically going to clue us in that that's a, call, uh, a Mexican bean beetle. Sometimes, occasionally, I have had people think that these were uh, the uh, multicolored Asian lady beetles. Um, it's not. One, the head is exactly the same color as the body, which is not the case with the lady beetles. Uh, the number of spots is different. And these are really, when you see them in person, they're a much more metallic color than the lady beetles ever are. So very different. But again, if you're growing beans, I would guess you probably see some of these out there. Now, this is just the adult. So what do the other stages look like? Oh, and when I was flipping the leaves over, I came across this guy. He is some sort of leaf hopper. Don't know who he is exactly. He was feeding on the beans. And while there are leaf hoppers for other plants across the landscape, some of which can carry uh, viruses for certain uh, plants, uh, I'm not aware of any for beans. So I just left him alone. I didn't squish him. Maybe he'll feed a, a spider for me. I don't know. But, you know, again, this is kind of the sort of thing I was talking about. When you start looking at plants and looking closely, you may end up finding things and you say, hey, is this a good guy or a bad guy? If you're finding one single leaf hopper, you're probably okay just to let it go. If you're finding a lot of them, you probably need to think about, okay, let's look at IDing this and see if this is a real concern. You know, that there's obviously there's apps you can get for plant identity. So we had a question from folks here with us today. Are there apps for insect identification? Uh, yes. So um, iNaturalist, which a lot of people use for plants, and it's a free one. It also will work for insects. Uh, there are some others. I don't use a lot of them, so I don't know them personally, but I do know like iNaturalist. Google Lens is another one people will use. Um, and I do know there are others, and certainly there are paid apps. Uh, identification apps, in my experience, work pretty good 80% of the time, uh, and the rest of the time they don't. Sometimes they may only get you to a, a, a family or an order in the case of insects, which is helpful, uh, but uh, it doesn't always get you to the end goal. But it's not a bad thing, so you do have to kind of put your own filter on it, figure out does that answer make sense for the crop I'm seeing it on, for the area I'm living in, growing in, but they are useful tools. They're a good start. So here is actually, uh, this was taken last year uh, on some beans that were just absolutely riddled uh, with uh, the Mexican bean beetle, that is actually uh, the larval stage. It's yellow, it looks spiky and scary. It's not, they squish great. Uh, be, be aware, you can get your fingers very yellow in color from squishing it. Um, so it, it is something that uh, squishing is a more than acceptable method of control if, if you're not too squeamish. Uh, knocking them into soapy water is another way you can do it and avoid uh, uh, chemical pesticide use in the garden. Uh, but, you know, again, be on the lookout for not just the adults. Uh, the eggs are often found when you have high numbers. You're probably going to see all three at the same time. Early in the season, you'll probably first see a little damage, find some adults, but know that if you got the adults there, they're going to be laying those eggs and you're going to have those further generations coming on. And so just be aware that the eggs are sort of football shaped, yellowish in color. Uh, and again, there's a good side shot that kind of shows the spiky nature of that larva. But again, those aren't any sort of irritating hairs or anything like that that we might find with some caterpillars. It just looks menacing. Um, netting is not the only, uh, you know, 
So I said there were a couple of candidates for netting whenever I see it. The other one being their bottom left, Japanese beetle damage. So we can get Japanese beetle damage on green beans, but Japanese beetles are generally loud and proud on top of the plant. You're going to see them. So they don't hide the way uh, the Mexican bean beetle does. So be aware it, netting is not only associated with Mexican bean beetles. So I had a question about how to get rid of the eggs. Uh, if you are utilizing, you know, any number of insecticides, whenever those eggs hatch and those larvae go to start eating, they're going to be exposed to the insecticide and killed. If you aren't using insecticides, hand picking and squishing is a great way to do it. I'd much rather pull off a leaf that has eggs on it than leave that leaf there and allow those eggs to hatch. So, you know, uh, sometimes people get worried about, well, you know, I don't want to be, you know, denuding my plant, removing all my leaves. Hopefully you're getting there early enough. You're flipping those leaves over the first sign you start seeing a little bit of damage and you're finding those eggs before you have a large population present. When you have large populations present, you can get eggs and even adults up on top of plants. So if you're seeing large number of adults obvious to your side as you're walking by or eggs up on top of plants, you probably have a very large population there of whatever insect we're talking about. But yeah, physical removal is a great way to get rid of the eggs. Use alcohol, alcohol or that you, you could, so you could use, you know, there are insecticidal soaps. Uh, rubbing alcohol is one we think about lots of times with house plants and some of our more stationary insects. If I see an egg cluster, I'm either going to squish it. If I don't think I'm effective at squishing it because of how they are, if they're a rigid egg or something, I'm just going to tear that part of the leaf off uh, because and then throw it away. Uh, I have, and in fact, I've got with me this evening where I took some squash bug eggs, threw them in a little container. They end up hatching out. So you can see the just uh, hatched instars of, of those squash bugs. If anybody wants to see how small they are, they're tiny. Because uh, think about how big these eggs are. They're very tiny as well. So, you know, uh, don't, don't tear it off and leave it in the garden or something like that. Take it with you, throw it away, burn it, whatever. Because uh, those eggs will hatch if they have an environment to hatch it. So here was one. We had bought some plants for a, a summer garden with, with a youth program. Uh, and we bought them ahead of schedule because we want to make sure we could get the selections we wanted uh, and not be disappointed three weeks later. And so one day I was looking at the plants. I'm like, hey, I'm seeing white stuff on the top of a pepper leaf. Why am I seeing white stuff on the top of a pepper leaf? It's not supposed to be there. So that clued me in. Something's going on here. Look a little closer. What do we have? Aphids. Now these happen to be on top of the leaf. So that right there is telling me, uh-oh, we've probably got a big problem. And there are quite a few aphids on some of the plants. Um, the white that you're seeing there, sometimes it'll be more tan in color occasionally. Those are actually the shed exoskeletons of the aphids as they grow. They really show up on a green leaf as opposed to the green aphids, which do not. So to me, seeing that white told me white's not supposed to be on that leaf. Why, you know, remember, it goes back to be on the lookout for something that's out of the ordinary and then answer, why is it, why is this here? That white was actually those shed exoskeletons as those aphids grew. And so insecticidal soap did a good job taking care of them, uh, did a couple of applications to make sure we got them all before they went to the garden. Uh, but again, on top of the leaf is not where we normally see these. So you don't always see those shed exoskeletons. What's more normally seen, and this was on a, another plant, not the literal same plant, but another plant, the bunch is on the right there. We have aphids on the underside of the leaf. What you'll notice is you don't see a lot of shed skins there. That white color is missing. They're obviously there, so I don't think you would miss this if you flip that leaf over. But uh, because of gravity helping the shed skins fall off or the shed exoskeletons, you're not going to have that clue on the underside of a leaf necessarily. And so, you know, you can sometimes look for clues such as things on the top of leaves. A, a good one when you have aphids, you might start noticing leaves that look extra shiny. It's because the aphid honeydew, which is to say their fecal matter, is rich in sugar. And so it will actually, when they poop, 
Uh, it's excess, basically, sap that they've consumed. It's high in sugar. We have some funguses that will actually grow on that sooty mold. So in landscape plants and things like that, uh, we will find sooty mold associated with aphids or scale insects, which is another sap feeder. Uh, and so, you know, looking for sooty mold, looking for leaves that look like they have something sticky on them. And you're like, why is that sticky stuff here? Look in the leaves up above it and see if you don't see an insect feeding there and depositing that honeydew. Uh, sometimes you will find ants associated with aphids because they love the sugary poo. Uh, <laughs> I know it sounds terrible, but uh, it's a resource. Uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, it, and, you know, when people talk about, oh, there was a tree and it dripped sap on my car. Trees don't really just drip sap unless they've been cut. And, and even then it, they don't do it forever. So if you're under a tree and you're getting sap on your car, you're probably getting honeydew from insects. So if it's your tree, you might want to investigate a little further and see if you've got scale insects or aphids or something on that tree, because you very well could. I had said earlier, look for things that are inconsistent in size, that there's a size anomaly. So very often with aphids, it's not just on a leaf. You can find them on stems or on, uh, depending on the exact leaf type, on petioles. So on the left is kind of the scenario I'm talking about. This is aphids on milkweed. If you were looking at this plant, if that's the only leaf and stem that's infested with these aphids, that stem is going to look fatter than the rest of them. Why? Because it's covered in aphids. It's going to look physically larger. Now, with this particular aphid, they're bright yellow. They're getting all those plant chemicals that make them taste nasty. So they're saying, hey, don't eat me. So it's a little bit obvious that this is there. But if you compare that stem to others on the plant that are not covered in aphids, you're going to notice it's different. It looks out of place. The other thing with aphids, if you're seeing numerous lady beetles, uh, particularly in all the, and we'll get to this towards the end, all the life stages, not just the adults, but also you're finding uh, the larva, you're finding the pupa. If you're seeing all that on plants, you probably have some aphids around it. There's other things that they ate too, but very often when I see high levels of lady beetles, I find high levels of aphids. So just be aware uh, the lady beetles aren't there unless there's a food source. So if it's not aphids, it could be another insect, but certainly they're a prime candidate for it. So this happened last year, looking in a garden. What's that black stuff on my tomato? Because again, green tomato is not supposed to have black stuff on it. And this was raised beds, they were mulched. So it's like, why is that there? Well, if you look closer, no, this is not the same tomato. If you think, wow, it's a weird looking tomato. Don't worry, it's not the tomato. Uh, I, I borrowed this to find a better picture. If you look closely at what was on there, it kind of looked sort of uh, star shaped or maybe even flower shaped. These happen to be green because they are very fresh. As they age, they turn black. And so these can be smaller, they can be larger. What these actually are is fecal matter. I don't know why there's so much fecal matter in this talk, but there is. Uh, <laughs> If you look closely and start looking, what you find are hornworms. So especially if you have big, robust, healthy plants, you may not notice the defoliation or the leaves and stems being chewed off because you've got a big, giant plant. But what you may notice, and again, depending what sort of mulch you have down or like that, it was on, you can find it on the leaves sometimes or on the fruit, you'll actually find their fecal matter first. That's the thing that says what's going on here. That's a thing that I noticed. You don't, you wouldn't otherwise necessarily see it because these guys, again, are trying to blend in and as big as they can get, they still blend in really, really well on these plants. And so, um, that one there is a tobacco horn worm because it has the red little horn on, on the end there, uh, as well as the diagonal stripes rather than the V-shaped ones. But it doesn't matter. Horn worms, you deal with them the same way when they're small. Uh, BT sprays such as Dipel, Bacillus thuringiensis can work. Spinosad can work well. These are true caterpillars. 
Uh, and so, you know, uh, the, they are, what is it, the hawk moth. Uh, it's a neat looking moth. It is a true moth, so it's flying at night. Uh, don't necessarily see it a lot, but uh, it's definitely around if you have these guys in your garden. And these uh, can feed on um, other solanaceous plants. So, you know, uh, we have tobacco hornworm, very similar, and basically tobacco being in the same family, solanaceous family. So, question? Oh, uh, I was going to ask them if it was a caterpillar that was in the answer. So. So what's the picture on the right? Something doesn't look right. Well, first off, it's a dead hornworm. That's a good thing if we're wanting to keep our plants happy. But what's all the white stuff on its body? Those are actually cocoons from a parasitic wasp. So if you're in your garden and you come across a caterpillar that has all these white things stuck to it, leave it be. Because what has happened is wasps have come, they've laid their eggs in there and those are the cocoons and from those you're actually going to get more wasp mm -hmm. and those wasps are going to kill more caterpillars so this is actually uh, uh you know this is biological control from nature so this is where hey you you have attracted beneficials so let them do their job so if you see one of these like that even if the caterpillar is munching down on the plant leave it it's going to pay off dividends to let it be killed by those wasps with, rather than removing it out of that area. Yep. So if you don't see the eggs, do you leave them? Or do you nope. It, it, if you don't see those, uh, and those are actually cocoons, so those actually aren't the eggs. We don't see the eggs because the eggs get inserted by the wasp into the caterpillar. Those are actually the cocoons that the pupa will be in and then the uh, adult wasp will emerge from. But if you see just a caterpillar without those on it, you can remove it. Now, you know, it, it's always the, the, the question of, you know, we've got some herbs and things like that that are host plants for butterflies. So, you know, if you're growing parsley or dill or things like that, you may have a caterpillar on there eating. And so I always encourage people, if you've got the space, plant a little extra. So if you do have one of those caterpillars on there, you can leave it alone and let that turn into a butterfly. Uh, if you feel that way about hawk moths, you're more than welcome to do that with tomato hornworms as well. Um, so, you know, everybody gets to make that decision for themselves. So what I thought we would do, and I don't, this is one of those things we can go very long in time and I'm hoping to wrap up quickly. So I'm going to go through these kind of quick. Uh, if you're on here online, I will get you a copy of the uh, slides and email maybe tomorrow. I'm not going to promise that. I've got a few things I've got to do, but certainly early next week on Monday, I think I should be able to get that accomplished. So these are just some we'll see. So cabbage worms, caterpillars that we see on all the brassicas. There's more than one out there. This happens to be uh, an imported cabbage worm. If you're seeing white butterflies fluttering around in your spring garden. I used to like those white butterflies. Yeah, you used to like them. And, not yeah. I watched them eat those things. I think yep. Cool. Exactly. So those white butterflies leave behind eggs, which turn into green little caterpillars that will absolutely destroy brassicas. Uh, this is one, again, it's not uncommon. You start seeing a few hoes on some leaves. If you look closely, you'll again see fecal matter from caterpillars. Because again, it's a different color green that stands out on the plant. Uh, that can be the first thing that catches your eye. We have great control of this with some things like BT, spinosad can work as well, and certainly our broad general insecticides. Uh, but very common if you're growing brassicas, you'll, whether spring or fall, either one, you're gonna see those. Harlequin bugs are another one, brightly colored, don't hide quite as much as some. Uh, the uh, nymphs you see there, newly hatched. The eggs are looking kind of really neat. They're barrel shaped and the eggs look black and white when they're on the plant. But look at how small they are. That is a leaf and you can see the vein there is very large in proportion to that egg uh, that's left behind there. So these are very small when they're laid when they first hatch, extremely small but you can see them. And so they can be rather uh, aggressive on brassicas. Very small scale if you get in there early, hand picking can work, but insecticides are certainly warranted on our brassicas. Uh, cucumber beetles, 
On the organic side, we really don't have good options. So this is one sometimes home gardeners will ask, do we have good organic options? Um, the pyrethrin, uh, um, pyganic is one of the brand names. I think maybe the only brand name out there on the market on the organic side. It, it, it works well, but it's extremely expensive. Uh, and it has the same concerns that we have with, uh, you know, protecting uh, beneficial insects that we do with the synthetic chemicals. Uh, so we really don't have great organic options with this one. These can cause a lot of problems. They can cause tremendous amounts of feeding damage, not on foliage, but also on fruit. So the watermelon there you see upper center, if you actually felt that or saw that in person, that grayish area, the tannish area is actually where they have eaten off the top layer of the watermelon's outer rind. So you actually have the green gone. So you have the, and it's kind of scabbed over for lack of a better word. Same thing with the pumpkin. So this is not just feeding on leaves, but you can see there upper left, just a newly emerged seedling. And we have several cucumber beetles feeding on it and causing significant damage. Um, there's actually been researchers that have shown that cucumber beetles will go down in the soil to attack um, germinating seeds as those hypocotyls start emerging out of the seed. They'll attack the stems as in the bottom left. And if you've ever pulled a cucumber out of the garden and on the underside, especially that was in contact with the ground, if you saw damage like on the right, you were dealing with cucumber beetle damage. If that's not enough for you, cucumber beetles can also transmit bacterial wilt, which is a disease. So this is where you just go out and you look and your plants are just wilted down overnight. And within a few days to a week, they're dead. Uh, there are some tests you can do with, uh, you know, to see if it was bacterial wilt, uh, but it's a disease that is carried by cucumber beetles. So this is one that's a real problem. Commercial growers really do their very best to get this one well in hand because not only is it all that cosmetic damage they cause, they can cause you to lose a planting really quickly. Squash bugs. Uh, so squash bugs, as the name would imply, are on our cucurbits, on our squashes, as well as the other cucurbits like cucumbers, et cetera. You see the nymphal stage there in the upper left looks different, but not insanely different from the adult you see bottom center. On the right are the little kind of um, reddish brown colored eggs. Those were actually a picture taken by me on a farm that was just absolutely covered up uh, in squash bug eggs. Uh, you don't normally find them on top of leaves. So this is one of those scenarios. If you are seeing these eggs up on top of leaves, you are having a heavy infestation. Uh, this can be a real problem, can cause a lot of damage. So it's another one to be on the lookout for. Um, there's stink bugs that kind of look similar, but they don't have as long a body. Some of those are bad guys. There's just a couple that aren't. Um, there's leaf-footed bugs look extremely similar, except their rear uh, leg is wider on the bottom portion. That's why they're called leaf-footed. It looks odd if you were to have them side by side but not an uncommon pest at all. When you have high numbers, they can kill plants quite readily. Um, they're again, they're sap feeders. Uh, you will see leaves sort of getting crisping around the edges. As you see on the right, they can attack fruit directly. Again, home gardeners, you know, if you're doing some control, uh, you can have a good outcome with these, uh, but they can reach pretty dramatic levels if you're not doing a good job. Squash vine borer, it is a uh, moth. So we see the adult there on the right, looks kind of waspish. It's called a clear wean moth because they do sort of mimic wasp uh, in appearance. Uh, but you see the larva there that's been pulled out of that stem. As the name would tell you, they bore into the stem. Lots of times we'll see a uh, sawdust, sort of wet sawdust looking material coming out of a stem and that tells us we've got one inside. You can sometimes open that stem up, remove that larva as you see there, that white grub looking guy, uh, and actually the plant recover. 
uh, doing some things such as letting your uh, squash vines root down along the ground so they have multiple rooting points can sometimes limit the damage if um, they get attacked by this. Uh, BTs can be effective, but again, you got to be applying that before they show up. And there again, it's just another example. Sometimes you'll see those uh, vines split open. And again, that sawdust sort of looking material there. Colorado potato beetle, a significant pest of basically any of our solanaceous crops. Um, the larva uh, there in the bottom looks a little similar, sort of, but not really to some ladybug pupa. So just be aware what that looks like. Eggs are sort of, again, ovalish football shape, orangish in color. And we have the adult up there on the upper left. Again, this is one that I have seen these drop off plants as you approach them. So they do, they are great at hiding from you. So the question, is this a Colorado potato beetle? You're like, he's tricking us. Definitely not. I know it's definitely not. And you'd be correct. This is actually a false potato beetle. Looks extremely similar. Uh, the big difference is, let's see if I can pull up the pointer. The big difference is, is if you look on their wing covers, right here, you don't simply have only black and white. You have that sort of brownish, copperish color again uh, that's elsewhere on the body. And so that's the difference here. You only have black and white, and here you have that color. So it's quick and easy to tell them apart in the garden. Um, but they look extremely similar just up on a quick glance. False potato beetle is not really a true pest. Yeah, it could be in your garden. Yeah, it could be eating on something. It's not a problem. Cholera potato beetle can absolutely hammer your solanaceous crops. So making sure it is not a false potato beetle can kind of, you know, make sure you're not doing more than you have to. But if you don't want to misidentify a Colorado potato beetle as a false one, uh, because that would be a, a bad situation. Uh, corn earworm, also known as tomato fruit worm. It's a caterpillar. It's the same uh, insect, just depending which host it's feeding on. Uh, you know, a lot of these, they're attacking plants. This one is actually attacking that harvestable portion that we pull. So the corn ear, uh, the ear of corn rather, or the tomato fruit itself, if you already see a hole in a fruit, it's already inside there. So your opportunity to put an insecticide on as a barrier is already gone. You can either remove the fruit when you see it and toss it if it's immature, or if it's close to harvest, maybe see if it's salvageable by cutting out certain areas of it. Bad thing about these is their damage does allow for decay organisms to come in. So sometimes it's not literally the physical damage from that uh, fruit worm, but it is actually the decay that moves into that open wound that causes the loss of that fruit. Flea beetles, very common plants on our brassicas, but will also attack our solanaceous plants. Uh, there are some weeds that are solanaceous in the garden that you will see them just absolutely hammer. They must taste great to them. Um, very small, dark. There are some that have two stripes on them, so there's a little bit of variability. Uh, but this is one that on very young plants, plants that are struggling and not doing well, they can absolutely hammer. So this is probably more of an early season one. This is one that uh, floating row covers can work well on uh, early in the season because once you remove that for pollination purposes, for instance, like with eggplants, um, you've got a plant that is larger and more robust and can deal with the problem. Uh, it's not uncommon to see plants outgrow flea beetle problems, especially if you're doing some sort of control like insecticidal soaps. Uh, or things like that, uh, that you will actually have a, a good outcome. So this is one, if you've got happy, healthy, fast growing plants with some control efforts, you should come out okay. But they can be a real problem. Keep in mind, not every insect out there is bad. We do have beneficial insects. I've already mentioned this, we'll not go over that again. But there, if you notice on that earlier picture, we actually had those uh, cocoons were open on the end because those wasps have already left. In this case, they have not left yet. So we do have some positive 
uh, stink bugs, for instance. We also have some uh, pest stink bugs. Uh, these actually feed on other insects and see they're brightly colored. And there's also that tan form there that looks the same, but essentially has uh, just a different color phase. And what you're looking, uh, you know, some distinctive things are the two black spots or the stripes on the leg as well. Uh, to differentiate those from the pest stink bugs. Uh, this is a nymph of those, again, looks different, not exactly the same as the adult, but not uh, amazingly different either. Uh, praying mantis, uh, we actually have three possible species. Only one of those is native, the Carolina mantis. It's also the smallest. Uh, the European and the Chinese are both larger. Uh, these are predatory insects, not bad to have in the garden, but just be aware that they are generalists, meaning they will eat any other insect they can, including the good guys. It's the balance of nature. It is what it is, but just be aware that uh, they are not targeting specific pest species for us. Uh, the thing to understand is these are the three egg cases. They each look different, but to some extent, a little bit similar. One caution, uh, well, I guess two cautions. One, don't bring these indoors if you happen to find these in the fall or winter because they'll think it's spring and hatch. <laughs> so you can have uh, little praying mantises all over the place if you do that. Two, if you are finding these and you're thinking, hey, I'm going to stick these all in the garden, spread them out as much as you can because the, the young ones, when they hatch, they'll eat each other just as quick as they'll eat another insect. So if you just put them all together, you're kind of creating like a free for all sort of massacre. Somebody's going to win and come out of it. But if you spread them over a larger area, you'll probably end up with more uh, mantids actually in the garden. So just be aware of that little quirk to it. Uh, you can actually purchase these egg cases online, I believe. The problem with releasing beneficial insects, whatever it is, into a garden is you're releasing it into the open environment. And it's going to go where there's food or environment that it's like. So just because you release something in your garden doesn't mean you're going to keep it there. So just be aware of that. Lace wings, a great predatory insect. The larval stage eats things like uh, aphids. Uh, does a great job of that. Neat thing about them is their egg in the upper right is actually on a little stalk. So they'll actually lay a single egg at a time with a, a, attached to a leaf by a little stalk. And I've actually seen this before. Looks like an ear with comments. Well, the, the bottom one, uh, so comment that the larval stage sort of look like an earwig, kind of, except on an earwig, the pinchers aren't really pinchers and they're on their abdomen instead of the head. Mm -hmm. So these are actually pinchers. They use those to actually grab like aphids. Um, but on an earwig, they're actually on the abdomen of the earwig. So similar appendages, but side by side, I don't think you would mistake one for the other. Ground beetles in all sorts of colors and sizes can be found. What's great about these guys is, you know, sometimes people are afraid about using things like mulch in the garden because I think, well, what about something like slugs? Ground beetles are also going to be attracted by that mulch. They eat other insects. They eat slugs. We don't necessarily see these a lot unless we're in the garden moving mulch around and things like that because they're largely nocturnal. So these are active at night when we're not out there for the most part. So lady beetles, not uncommon. Upper left, we have our multicolored Asian lady beetle that's not native. Uh, remember I said, you know, sometimes people think about the um, Colorado potato beetle. They get it confused with this. You can kind of see some similarities in color from that range of colors you see in the upper left. But again, that head is not the same color as the body. And that's a big difference. And if you look closely, they kind of have an M shape or a W shape in black on their head. That would also be absent from the Colorado potato beetle. So either one of those characteristics should quickly rule it out. Uh, we've got the old classic black and red spotted, seven spotted lady beetle. Upper right, this is one you may be less familiar with because it doesn't look like a lady beetle. It's not round, it's elongated, and it's pink. It's pink with black spots, but that is a spotted lady beetle. Does exactly the same thing that the other lady beetles do, just looks different. So that's one sometimes people are surprised to find out about. What's interesting about the lady beetles are the different 
life stages. So uh, bottom left and center, you have your two, uh, you have larval stages of both the seven spotted as well as the multicolored uh, Asian lady beetle. Again, to me, they look kind of similar to a lacewing larva and they're kind of doing the same job, even though the adults look very differently. The two pictures, top and bottom right, are actually pupil cases. So this is where that larva is turning into the beetle and emerging. Those are pupil cases. I could see where someone might mistake those for uh, the uh, Colorado potato beetle uh, larva. Po uh, yeah, Colorado potato beetle um, larva because they're reddish, orangish in color. There's some spots on them. But again, side by side, they should not be mistaken one for the other. These aren't moving. They don't have a visible head. But again, a quick glance it would be worth double checking, making sure what you're looking at. Upper left are newly hatched uh, ladybug larvae. Again, you can see how small they are on that leaf. So again, small things, you're going to want some magnification to see the body shape, uh, mouth parts, to see exactly what you're dealing with. So pollinators come in a lot of shapes and sizes. It's not just our honeybees, which aren't native here. Uh, we have a lot of native species of pollinators that do a great job. Things like squash bees that actually co-evolved with squash to do that pollination. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind, we need to do what we can to protect those. Last but not least, not an insect, maybe sometimes called a bug, spiders. Spiders are great in the garden. There's all sorts of forms of them, different ways they hunt and attack. Again, the thing to think about is these are generalists when it comes to uh, predatory actions. They don't target specific pests. So again, it might grab a ground beetle or something like that. That's a good guy from time to time, but on the balance, uh, the more uh, beneficial insects out there, even if they sometimes target a good guy, I think the better off we are. So resources. Um, those two main resources I mentioned tonight, as well as a number of other pest control resources are accessible through this link or through the QR code. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me if you need a paper copy, uh, but this is one way I can kind of limit how much paper I have to uh, deal with. Um, one thing I will mention is University of Kentucky. They have put together some IPM scouting guides that you'll find on this resource. It has great pictures in it, not only for insects, but also diseases and even environmental problems. So, you know, sometimes we have problems that are happening with a plant. We are seeing things happening with that plant, but is it something environmental rather than a true pest? So is it a nutrient deficiency or a water issue or things like that? And so I think those are great resources because they do have that whole um, spectrum of potential uh, for you to review. So some good resources in there. And as always, feel free to reach out with questions.